All right, here we go. Yo, 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 what up, though, man? I got a, a gatekeeper in the building, a Detroit legend in the building, a Grammy-nominated music executive, founder of BMB Records, responsible for acts such as Trick Trick, Charlie Baltimore, Icewear Vezo, Cash Dial, Ayo and Tayo, and many more. Man, and according to the Detroit News, he's a rap mogul and a heroin kingpin. Thank you for entering the mogul state of mind. Brian Peanut Brown, how you doing, my guy? Excellent, my brother. Excellent. What's happening hey, with man. you? Hey, man. Hey, man. I appreciate you sitting down with me, man. I'm excited to capture your journey. Uh, shout out to uh, Danny D. Girl, man. I came up there and did an interview a while ago, man. And she she dropped your name like, man, you got to get this dude. He animated. Things of that <laughs> nature, man. You got a hell of a story. So I'm ready to capture that journey. Okay. I'm ready for you. Man, so Detroit native, man. What, what, what part of uh, Detroit you from? Um, west side, uh, some would say southwest by living always in one area, but it's really the west side. Okay. And, and what was that like growing up over there on, on the west side for you? I'm from Joy Road. Oh, okay. Um, over there, it was pretty much like everywhere else. You know what I mean? Um, with the exception that we two blocks away from Crunk, so everybody thought they can fight. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? Outside of that, it's just like growing up anywhere else in Detroit. You know what it is. Got you. Now... Growing up in Detroit, like, what was your, your your family dynamics like and what year frame, you know what I'm saying? Like, just growing up in Detroit, like, what what time period do you stamp as, like, your your, your heyday in, um, in Detroit? It'd be, ground. My heyday in Detroit was the late 80s. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, early 90s, real short, like, 91, 92. You know what I'm saying? Outside of that, right after that, I went on the run, so... I say oh, late man. 80s, early 90s. Okay. Now, I, I want to kind of take this journey on through. Um, so you grew up mostly with your grandparents, but your, your uncle and your dad kind of had a name for themselves. Like, how did you end up with your grandparents and not with your parents, especially like your mom? Well, shit, my, my, my father was in and out of prison all the time. You know mm. what I'm saying? And my mother, uh, she was kind of like just floating from time to time. But um, even when she, you know, got her due, you know, I went to go stay with them, you know, periodically. But to, to have a good, stable environment, it was it was better for me and my sister to just live with my grandparents. Hey, gr growing up without like just being with your parents full time, did you ever have any resentment towards your parents? Nah, you know, um, back then, you know, the the uh, parenting was a little different. You know what I'm saying? We couldn't we couldn't afford to harbor resentment. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, it was there was parenting for real. You know what I mean? So, all that resentment was out the door. Uh, nevertheless, like, and I didn't have no resentment, but this is probably what formed my character. You know, um, I, like I said, I was the only child till I was uh, five and a half, going on six. Then my sister was born, and when she was born, it was like my family like forgot about me. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Um, and, and in the midst of that, it forced me to want to be accepted. It made, it made me like do extra to guarantee that some that, that y'all going to love me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that carried over into this day. You know what I'm saying? I go over and beyond and make sure my partner love me, fuck with me, my, my women love me. You know what I mean? So I just go over and beyond to solidify you know what I'm saying? My presence in somebody's relationship or, you know, in, in the foundation. Got you. Now, you 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 talk a lot about your uncle impact on you. Kind of what what was your your dad and your uncle known for in the streets in Detroit? Shit. <laughs> My uncle was known for uh we and just being like the mayor of the neighborhood. My father was really known for shit, murder, for real. You know, um, he was a he was a higher hit man in and out of prison. You oh, know man. what I mean? Um, yeah, that's just what he. That's just who he was. You know what I'm saying? But gotcha. for the most part, he was a hell of a family man, and he was a family man to the community. At, at what age did you start to realize, especially your dad being a hitman? When did you? How did you find out he had that occupation? Man, I didn't find out until like um, my teens. But when I was like four or five, he uh, had this guy in the living room. And he called me out the bedroom and he wanted me to uh, shoot the guy. You know what mm. I'm saying? Now, at this time, I wasn't even really 
too conscious of, you know, guns like that. So, you know, I'm just sitting there holding the gun like he like shoot him. And I'm just looking at the guy screaming, crying. Don't do it. Don't do it. You know what I'm saying? I kind of like froze up for real. You know what I mean? And um, he smacked me up. Don't get the fuck on going back in the bedroom with your mama. You know what I mean? But nevertheless, that I, you know, I, I, at that point, I knew it was different than any other any other father son relationship or any. You know what I mean? Any yeah. any p- parent you know uh, child relationship. So <clears throat> at that point, I say four or five. Got you. But found so you, out he was a hitman. I ain't find out he was a hitman until I was probably like fifteen, when um somebody was looking to kill him. Ran up on him with the gun. It was a revolver. He grabbed the revolver part from what I'm hearing in the streets, took the gun, killed him broad daylight, and then he then that's when he went on a run. And so when he went on a run to Florida, and uh, just all the, the 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 I was old enough to understand all the talk that was going on in the streets. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just hearing about so many people that he's already killed. Got you. Now, with your uncle, he was more on the hustling side. Did, did he ever introduce you to the hustling side? When did you find out about your, your uncle's occupation? Um, shit, he had me in it. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> it, you know, because he really only sold weed, so it wasn't really too much of a threat. But, you know, from time to time, when he ain't have time, when he had want to shoot a move or something, he just had me sitting at the house, you know what I'm saying, serving nickel and dime bags, whoever come. You know what I mean? So he pretty much had me in it the whole the whole time and just watching him throughout, you know, um, my growing up. You know, we right there. So he was pretty much raised like my brother versus my uncle. Got you. Because his parents raised now, me. Now, now, growing up in Detroit, do you, how how aware were you of the crack epidemic, uh, epidemic in, in Detroit? Like, were you aware before crack? Do you remember a time before crack took its precedence? As of and when it did take over, take over. Yeah, because during that time when my father uh, tried to have me shoot the dude, they they was buying cocaine, and at that time, ounces of cocaine was eighteen hundred dollars. I just remember him talking about it all the time. It was eighteen hundred dollars an ounce. You know what I'm saying? So this might have been in the seventies, early seventies. That uh, it might have been in the early seventies that uh, I noticed. You know what I'm saying? The cocaine and I'm cooking it into rock form and little vials. They should like use these little tube things. Very different than how it's, it's being cooked now. Now, when did you see start to see like the the environment, the neighborhood start to go down from the effects of crack? Mm, that might have been like eighty five, eighty five, eighty six for me. 85, 86, I started start seeing it go down. Gotcha. Now, at that time, like Detroit, of course, is notorious for a, a lot of street crews, um, things of that nature. A lot of dope name, big names come out of Detroit. Mm-hmm. At the time when you were more active, what street crews were kind of around at that time? Was it a, um, was it um, like best friends, things of that nature? Who was around? Yeah, Running the streets um, at that time too. Notorious on the east side it was definitely the best friends. Um, Notorious on the east side was definitely the best friends. On the west side, PAs <laughs> hands down. You know what I mean? They 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 uh created records everywhere they went. You know what I'm saying? So it was you know PAs, best friends. Then you had um, and it, it was different. You had like streets. You know what I'm saying? You had Finkel. Yeah. You had Six Mile Crews. You know what I mean? Um. Uh, it was pretty much like streets. Got you. Did did you ever? Because I know like YBI was one of those crews that bump that jumped up when a lot of young guys, real young, getting money. That's around your age group as well, right? Yeah, a little bit before my time, honestly. Before, you know what I'm okay. saying? Um, a little bit before my time, but they, yeah, they definitely was. And I remember even one time, I called myself trying to roll for the young boys, and they had me over there on. Um, Shit, East Warren and some East Warren and I forgot that the street they had walkie talkies the whole nine yards, little headphone joints, yep. the whole nine yards. I wasn't numbered about fifteen, sixteen. That ain't work out too long. My parents found out and shit, that was over with. So I, I saw you say on the um in the interview like unlike everybody else who had crews, you was kind of a loner. Definitely. Um, kind of take me into the game where you started, you know, doing things more so on your own, being your own boss. 
from out under your uncle's wing, doing your own thing? Um, that happened around 1987, the, the, you know, maybe around September, November, October of 87 when um, I was going to college for my first year. And my grandparents was giving me $5 a day to go to school. So I would put probably two, three dollars in the gas tank and two two dollars for some snacks. Now they give me ten dollars. They got mad. They, they they just got fed up because you know what I'm saying. I, I should I had a free ride to Jackson State and a couple other universities for basketball. So they just got fr- frustrated one day. It's like, fuck, I'm giving you five dollars, nigga. Like you ain't you ain't really trying to do nothing going to a little local college. But at that time, they had me so shook up about the streets being so bad. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not really knowing what they're really scared about. My father out there killing every motherfucking body, so they ain't want them to fuck, you know, mess me up from what he's doing. So I found yeah. that out later. But for the most part, they had me scared that the shoes were so bad. So when it's time to go to college, nigga, I'm, I'm going to that local college right there on Grand River and Greenfield. You know what I mean? I'm not going way to no Mississippi or Florida or Indiana where y'all are trying to get me to go. So, um, but... Damn, I lost my train of thought. What was that? Uh, we were talking about uh, your, your grandparents giving you the $10 to go to school. Oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. How you so, started so, getting into the game yourself. Right. So when they took it down to five, I just wanted to make $10 a day. So what I did was I got with the lo- one of the local drug dealers, you know what I'm saying, and asked him, can he give me an eight ball? You know what I mean? So I didn't know back then that they'd take an eight ball even though it was only costing 150, they'd take an eight ball and cut four, 500 out of it. Mm. So if I'm paying 150, I only wanted $10. So I cut 160. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? My rock's bigger than everybody. You know what I mean? I'm not knowing this. So as I, as I, se- I sell it, it, I sell out like that. So I call and bring me some more, call and bring me some more. So by, um, by, the, by the time for me to go to school the following day, I done sold six, seven, eight balls. Damn. You know what I'm saying? So now I'm think I'm good all week. I don't got to sell no more. But the people that was using crack was like, come on, nut, come on, man. You know, and just convinced me to just keep doing it. And then before you know it, I had a crack, I had a crack house doing no less than $25,000 a day. Man. Mm-hmm. So being that you, you, you kind of moved along by yourself for the most part, how did you end up getting locked up like take me down that journey of you going on a run and ending up in prison okay um well back in 92 one of my actually it was actually connect the guy that i was uh dealing with it was a very good friend of mine um he was uh the actual connect honestly and um he had broke bad i didn't know that though you know what i'm saying he had broke bad and he called me to come to come talk to him. He kept saying, they're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. Now, but before that, my girlfriend, mother, asked to borrow some money. So when I loaned her the money, she went and done a deal with an FBI informant. Mm-hmm. So they arrested her, came and got me out of bed. I was at home in bed with her daughter, took me down to the scene of the crime. You know what I mean? So... When I get down there, I had nothing to say to my lawyer's present. I had nothing to say to my lawyer's present. So by the time... I'm doing all this. My lawyer come in. So when he come in, which I charge my client with nothing, you know what I'm saying? So they said something to her. They were like, oh, she's straight. So she stayed there with him. I left with my attorney. And so I tell the connect what happened. So he calls me to meet him. So when I go meet him, he tell me, okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to call him and tell him you work for this dude. So I'm like, man, I'm not calling him. They let me go. Nigga, I'm, I'm not calling them, telling them nothing. You know what I mean? Like, no, nah, I'm not doing that, bro. Like, no. So after that happened, shortly after that happened, he ended up getting killed. But I was the last person seen with him. So mm-hmm. I was a suspect for homicide. You know what I'm saying? So what they did was, because I was only a suspect, they couldn't charge me for homicide or get a warrant on me for homicide. So they lodged a warrant on me for when they picked me up for my girlfriend's house and, char- and indicted me for drugs. And what they did, they had scratched my paper off and said, refuse to talk. 
They scratched that off and said, refuse to sign. Now, every, all the information that she gave them, she's my girlfriend's mother, I got her heavily involved in my mix. So she know all my friends and everything. So all the information that she gave them, they created their own FBI 302 and said, I refuse to sign. You know what I mean? So um, right after that is when they got the warrant. You know what I mean? So they used, they tried to use that FBI 302 to get people to tell where I was at, but nobody knew. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I left, and um, the first place I went was um, San Antonio. Somebody, my mother's uh, old childhood friends was down there, and um, that was the first place I went. So so you arrive in prison. Huh? Here go a kid. I said, so you, you, you end up going to jail, right? Prison, right? Federal? Yeah, I went to jail... Shit, five years out. I was on the run for, for almost five years. So I ain't mm. go to jail until 90, October 96. How did you live off the grid for those five years when you was on the run? Man, um, it was crazy because I was only able to leave with $15,000. When everybody found out what happened, niggas was going to be millions of dollars, but they would not show up. You know what mm. I mean? So I had to end up leaving. They put my face on the news. Known for laundering millions from here to Chicago, Arizona, Colombia, Mexico, Guatemala, other parts of uh, Mexico, weekly. So I had to leave immediately. So after I left, I only had fifteen thousand. So what I did was I went and bought me a, a Ford Bronco, one of you know OJ Simpson joints. Yeah. And I got me an apartment, paid my apartment for six months. The rest of the money I got a Ford Bronco. Probably had about eight hundred for groceries. Every time I needed money, I would insurance drop my truck, take the wheels, top off seats, whatever the check is. I paid my rent up for six, seven months and, 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 you know, just do it like that until I was able to get some motion. until I was comfortable enough to move around. But what I was doing to make it easier for me to move around, I would call my people every day because I knew they was on me. Hey, meet me on Seven Mile and Grass shit. Wait about 45 minutes. Man, it was everywhere. I ain't go there. Yeah, meet me on um, Six Mile in Wyoming. You know what I mean? At, at, at the, you know, see, meet me on Six Mile in Wyoming. Wait about another hour. Man, these motherfuckers everywhere, man. I, I wasn't comfortable. You know what I'm saying? I do that shit every day four or five times. You know what I'm saying? To the point to where I felt like they was tired of listening to my people's phone. You know what I mean? So then I started sneaking in for real. Mm. Now, take me through the mindset of going on a run, though. Because, like, do you think, like, are you trying to go on a run to a, something, to you achieve something? Are you trying to go on a run and never get caught? Like, what's the mindset when you go on a run? Well, I was going on a run to never get caught and for them to... I guess I can say to the energy of that case subsided or until like whatever um, information they had, like kind of like got watered down. You know what I'm saying? You know, when stuff like that, when homicide happened, they really just want to try to make anybody a scapegoat. I didn't want to be the first motherfucking scapegoat. You know what I mean? So I just wanted to stay out the way for a little while. But in the midst of staying away, they start put me on TV and then they did the reenactment on America's Most Wanted, arm the dangerous, don't hesitate and shoot the kill. So they had programmed my psyche to kill. You know what I'm saying? Cause I'm like, I'm not letting, my thing was I'm not letting nobody kill me. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm not letting nobody kill me. You know what I mean? So like when I used to get pulled over, I used to be talking to myself, man, I know you got kids. I know you got kids, man. You wanna go home with your kids? Just give me my ticket and go on about your business. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, cause I was programmed to, not die, you know what I'm saying? Definitely not die or go to jail. So I program. I, they had me in a homicidal state. So For, how did they end up catching you? Like, what, what? Take me through the day when they finally caught up to you. Okay. Um. Like I said, I started moving around again. My little tri, my little triangle purse was uh Birmingham, Nashville, and Atlanta. So I got a stepbrother. His name was Lionel. You know what I mean? He said that he had needed some work. So I called my people in Florida. I had them meet me in Ohio. So with the car, the stash car. So when they meet me in Ohio, I call my little, I call my brother and tell them to meet me so I can exchange cars with them. Only this nigga coming to Rolls Royce. I'm on America's Most Wanted. 
top 10. They, at, this, <laughs> at this time, they got me on the same motherfucking page as Ben Laden. You know what I mean? So I'm like, man, I'm the fuck. Man, go, check, go get another car, bro. I can't drive this car, bro. Go get another car. So when I sent him to get another car, he ended up getting killed. So uh-huh. when he get killed, because I guess whoever he told, he told him he had to work. So when he go home, somebody pulled, you know, went to his house, he opened the door, they immediately killed him. Boom, killed his wife, boom. His girl hit up under a bunch of teddy bears. You know what I mean? So um, when I find that out, I immediately shoot to Detroit, put the stash car up. Now I'm trying to find out who killed my brother. You know what I mean? This is my stepbrother, one of my father's girlfriend's son. Yeah. So um, I'm just, you know, I'm on that type of mission. So I've been up for like two days now. So I... I ain't got no women in Detroit no more, so I, I call and sent for one of my friends in uh, Nashville. So when I sent for her, I didn't fell asleep over my uncle's house. You know what I'm saying? On Seven Mile and Murray, he I didn't fell asleep over his house and woke up late. Like, damn, let me go pick her up. Now I was in one of my um, friend's car from Pontiac. She had one of the Firebirds. Her name Ema. Ema. I was in Ema McGowan's car from Pontiac. And she had a Firebird. You know, you turn the lights on, the lights pop up, but the bottom fall yeah. lights come on. So the bottom fall lights was on, but the headlights wasn't on. But the fall lights so bright, I thought the headlights was on. So as I'm coming off Seven Mile and I'm crossing Southfield for to make that left onto Southfield to get on the freeway, I ride by a state trooper. He immediately turn around and get on me, put me right over in that mobile gas station right there on Seven Mile and Southfield on the... um. Southwest side of the street. So when he pulled me over, remember, I'm, I'm up there trying to find out who killed my brother. So he asked me to get out the car. So I'm like, fuck, Detroit. Because when I'm down south, the only thing they do, pull over, you ask for ID, check your ID. You can have your gun sitting on the damn, on, on, the, on the thing. You don't got to have no permit or nothing. You got that motherfucker sitting on the seat. They're going to check your motherfucking ID and let you go on about your business. So when I got pulled over, I got so comfortable being in the south you know what I'm saying? When I got pulled over, first thing it says, get out the car. My man, I'm like, motherfucking Detroit. Fuck. So I get out the car. And so I go to the back of the car. They searching the car. Woo, woo. Then they begin to search me. I tried to run. They didn't grab my head, hoodie, threw me around. The other guy draw it down. And they had they, they got my gun up off of me. So um, they took me to the precinct. And when they ran my name, I had a federal fugitive warrant on me. You know what I mean? Man. And uh, that's when I originally went to, went, to, went to prison. Well, not, I went to jail and I had a federal fugitive warrant on me. And that, that's when I went to the county. I stayed in the county like 13 months. 13 months. So mm-hmm. did you ever go to prison itself? No, I didn't go that time because they were so busy trying to pressure me to get me to tell on my colleagues. You know what gotcha. I mean? So they would just leave me in the county and what they was doing... If anybody know how the bullpen shit is, they'll wake you up 3.30 in the morning to go to court. You wake up, you go to the first bullpen on your floor, then you go to the next bullpen on your floor, then they send you downstairs, you go through about four bullpens till you change out. Well, they did this shit about 10 times. You know what I'm saying? And nobody never came to pick me up for court. So, but in the midst of them doing that, after about the fourth time, I had a friend of mine, Trevion Davenport and Sharice, Sharice Glenn. Sharice was going to law school. So when Trevion came to visit me, I'm telling her, I don't know what the fuck I'm charged with because I ain't been to court. She, so they thought I was lying. They thought I just ain't want to tell that, you know, that she thought I was in there for some crazy homicide shit. So they thought I was lying. So I'm telling listen, I don't know my charges. They, ne- they ain't never came and took me to court. So when um, I tell her that, she tell the girl Sharice, which was a law student at the time, she said, no, nah, they violating his rights. So when she said that, I had them talk to my attorney, John Royal. So when she was talking to him, he decided to file a motion on speedy trial. So we waited, um, we waited, uh, no, we filed a motion for speedy trial. Waited 79 days and then we filed a motion for a dismissal. The 81st day is when they took me to court. The very first time mm-hmm. ever. You know what I'm saying? And um, they granted, no, no, no. Filed a motion for, um, filed a motion for speedy trial. 
waited 93 days. Was it a motion for dismissal? Yeah, motion. Yeah, then we filed a motion for dismissal. They took me to court on the 181st day. On the 181st day, I went to court. I had to go to court in Ann Arbor. You know what I'm saying? And the judge, he said something like, this is the, this is the worst miscarriage of justice I've ever seen in my life. My case is in the law book, Joseph versus Brian Brown. This is the worst case of miscarriage of justice I've ever seen in my life. You know what I'm saying? Um, I just can't believe it. How come y'all just wouldn't bring him to court? You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? He was like, Lord, no. He, no, he didn't say Lord, no. He said, I do not want to do this, but I have to do this. And say, uh, case dismissed, Brian Brown, you're free to go. You know what I mean? So, wow. yeah, it's because, you know, they violated my speedy trial rights. And now people come home on my case now, U.S. versus Brian Brown. So um, that's how I end up coming home. But I did like 13 months in the county. So take me into the music journey. Like, when did you start jumping in to get into hip hop, the interest in hip hop? Because I see from the talent that you've picked and had on your roster, you you definitely got an eye for talent. Mm -hmm. So how did you get into the music? Man, it's crazy. Um, I'm really not a. <laughs> I'm really not in the music. I'm in the people. <laughs> it's just the people okay. that I love happen to be in the music. But uh, at the time, one of my one of my good friends was Click. You know what I'm saying, Sean McKinney. So he was he was managing Trick Trick at the time. You know what I'm saying? And Trick was a part of the, the group's uh, seven, uh, Goon Squad. So okay. um, he was managing Trick Trick. Click ended up getting killed. By this time, I'd done video. I've been in the video with him with Trick Trick and all that stuff and, and uh, Reedy. You know what I mean? So I grew a liking to Trick Trick. So when he got clipped, when he got killed, just out of respect for my dude and the love that I acquired for Trick, I wanted to further... You know what I'm saying? The brand. You know what I'm saying? So I was going to, I was still pushing the music under Click Boom. But by me being so humble, the family thought that I worked for Click. You know what I mean? But it was definitely yeah. the other way around. So they, they, they was coming at me all crazy, coming at me all crazy. So I said, fuck it. So I started another label call for Show Records. So when I started that label, they ended up doing their research and found out who I really was. You know what I'm saying? By this time, I'm off of him now. You know what I'm saying? I was doing this in his name, to, you know, to have so his family can have something. But but them I don't disrespect me so much. You know what I'm saying? I was off of doing it in his name and uh started a new company called for show records. So it was just me and Trick at the time. You know what I mean? So I I took Trick on his first national tour, maybe in 97, 98. Okay. 97, 98, and uh, we went out, we started off in California, and I ended up meeting uh, this guy named Dave Rosas, who was working with Interscope. Dave had a, a guy on his, on his label, on his team that, by the name of Sean Bolden. So me and Sean clicked so tough, when we clicked, he decided to, you know what I'm saying, come work with me. So he left Interscope and came and worked with me, and then me and him, took Trick on his first national tour. Got you. Now, I, I, I hear you You connect that out on the West Coast. Being out there, did you ever build a relationship with, like, with Shug, Big U, <laughs> things of that nature, those people out there? That's funny you say that, because when I tell you, he just literally called me 30 minutes ago. Yeah. Shug just called me 30 minutes ago, man, and I've been talking to him lately for about three months every day, four and five times a day now, trying to uh, formulate, you know what I'm saying, his story. You know what I'm saying? He's he's giving me the rights to push his story out, you know what I'm saying, for him. So I done put him with a couple of my publicists and they've been, you know, just on the phone extracting information for him, you know what I mean, yeah. to um to formulate, you know what I'm saying? He's, he got he got a hundred stories, man. Like talking to him is like a history channel. Like you learn I'm learning so much, man, about what I didn't know. For sure. So now you um so you got Trick Trick, y'all doing your thing, y'all on tour, things of that nature. Did you ever have any run-ins with like coming up with like Eminem and any other artists at that time? Trick Trick was coming up. Any other artists you was working with at that time? Yeah, we um, 
we had a run in with Trick, with Trick Daddy when we was in Florida promoting. And uh, and uh, his some of his some of his goons ran down on us. Was like y'all can't use that name, you know what I'm saying or whatnot. And uh, and uh, yeah, y'all can't use that name, you know what I mean. Uh, so they were trying to get us to follow him, you know what I'm saying. Trick caught the play, but we all had on iced out Rolexes and all that type of shit. So they probably was trying to try to run a play down. So he tried to get us to follow him. So as we was following him, we dipped off. You know what I'm saying? And then um, just after that, you know what I'm saying? Because of what they tried to do, we end up, you know, like booking them to come to Detroit. And you already know what it is at that point. <laughs> the infamous trick trick story. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I remember him being in high school, that DVD come out. And I remember everybody talking about trick trick. Trick daddy got his arm broke. Yeah. Yeah. It got was a lot. Man. It was club. crazy, man. Because at that time, we had really had the streets on lock and we was doing a lot of work for the community. So, you know, the police was supporting us and everything. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. not saying that they with the bullshit, but at that time, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like he couldn't get no help nowhere. And then even at the hotel, like, you know what I mean? Like we had people, the, all the people that from all the hotels, damn near worked for me at one point. What was the name of the club that, that Trick Trick had or partnered in? I want to say it was Legends. Was it Legends or Blue or some some yeah something like that? I, nah. I forgot the name of the club. That like, yeah, it was it, it was, was Legends. It's, it's um right across from that chicken place. What's, what's the name okay. of that club, man? It was I, I Legends, like it was but it was something Blue. I don't know. It was but right yeah, across from that chicken place, everybody... right there on Brush. Yeah, I, I just remember everybody saying like we we kind of felt like that was like Goon Squad headquarters. Yeah, like you go in there, you get booked, and you go in there, and you ain't from Detroit, and you ain't no good turns. We knew it was gonna be a problem. Yeah, and then Trick um, he was also part of a motorcycle gang too. So <laughs> that dude, man, he had his hands everywhere. Well, what do you think about Trick? Cause like I mean, I'm in Texas, even though I'm from Detroit, but everybody. If you come outside of Detroit and do an interview with anybody, Trick Trick name comes up. He he is kind of looked at as the boogeyman of Detroit, the guy you don't want to see when you show up. Yeah, he's definitely the guy you don't want to see. But what a lot of people don't know is that he only mean for he only there for good. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Because it all like 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 a lot of it started because the radio station wasn't playing none of the locals' music. You know what I'm saying? So Trick Trick wanted to sacrifice himself for all the local artists. So what he did was, if it was a live, it, it can be no live remote. He hear a live remote yeah. some, somewhere, he come and shutting it down, taking equipment, everything. You know what I mean? So, and that was only because they wasn't playing our music. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So then it went from that to, it went from that to artists coming here Promoters not want to play them. You know what I'm saying? Some kind of way they call Trick Trick. Trick Trick will show up, make the promoters pay them. Then on the flip side, promoters paying people to come. You know what I'm saying? They're supposed to be in there at 10, 11 o'clock. They don't get there to 145, the club closer too, and they want their back in. Call Trick. Trick, not say fuck the back end. He taking the front end back too. You know what I mean? Like you in violation, bro. You know what I mean? So for people that was doing that type of bad business, he made sure they weren't able to come here no more. Gotcha. He made it uncomfortable, but it was really, his thing was always protecting the community, protecting business. You know what I'm saying? It was never no, I'm a bully. He was never on that. You know what I mean? It was always protecting something. And that's what everybody missed. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, everybody uh, got, you know, misunderstood. Because everybody always brings, especially with the no fly zone yeah. and the checking in, people always think checking in was getting permission to come to the city. But I always remind people, like, no, what Trick was trying to do was saying, if you come in here, man, support the city. Put some yeah. artists on your not, show. Do Not some only feature. support so he can make sure you're good because you don't call him at the last minute when when yep. you probably, you know what I'm saying, having a situation. And then he's like, if you would have called me, then we wouldn't be going through this. Fair enough. Do you think, because like seeing where Detroit is right now, man, you Detroit has a sound. Detroit got Detroit type beats. People rapping like Detroit. 
you see in Detroit finally broke out. How much do you think of Trick Trick's sacrifice that he made allowed Detroit to get to where it is now in the hip hop yeah. industry? If it wasn't for him, it wouldn't be this. You know what I'm saying? It would not be this. You know what I'm saying? Because when I tell you they was not playing our music, bro, they was not playing our music. And we was doing everything. We was doing Coast for Kids. We was doing, you know, PAL League stuff. We was doing, we was cleanups. We was uh, 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 making songs and campaigns for uh, politicians. We did everything and they still would not play our music. You know what I'm saying? So we, st we would have been still 10 years behind. You know what I mean? Yeah. 10 years behind, man. And, you know, like, it definitely wouldn't be like this right now. You know what I mean? So he made a way for them to respect the artists here so they can get heard, so they can be, you know, respected amongst other states. Gotcha. But without now, him, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be like this. We'll still be a market begging for acceptance, begging for acknowledgement, begging for, you know what I'm saying, to be seen. Yeah. By his disturbance, it was known worldwide, and they didn't have no choice but to think about this place, you know what I'm saying, because of that no-fly zone. That was something talked about in every household. For in sure. The, in the industry. So when did For Show for show Records turn into BMB Records? And what does BMB stand for? Um, BMB stands for Breaking Major Barriers. Okay. And that's the acronym to it. But what it really stands for is Brian Maurice Brown. And the reason, gotcha. why, the reason why I chose to use my name is because I felt like that's what I've been doing my whole entire life. Okay. And so when did you switch from that for show to BNB? Like, when um, did BNB come about? Well, I created for sure records before the indictment. Okay. So I end up uh, I end up beating the first indictment through speedy trial. They re-indicted me again two years later after they lost the appeal. They re-indicted me again on a seven mile dog indictment. Not from Seven Mile. And um they had two guys in jail come testify against me at trial. One been in jail five years already, the other one been in jail six six years already. You know what I'm saying? The Simpson brothers. They came and testified against me at trial. And um, I blew trial. And when I got out is when I started. Um... No, that's not when I got out that time, I, I started B&B Records. But uh, yeah, when I got out is when I started B&B Records. OK, so that on that second trial, trial that you blew, how much time did you end up being locked up for that time? They gave me 188 months. Um, my, my original sentence was 120 months because they added a gun to it. They enhanced me to uh, 188 months. And then okay. uh, um, when they came out with that new crack law, because the guys, because they were trying to give me a lot of time, the guys that testified against me in trial, they said that they took the, 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 the cocaine and cooked it up. So they ended up charging me with crack too. So that was an enhancement as well. So, but when they came out with that new crack law and, and was turning over convictions, convictions, they gave me 40 months off of that. And the 13 months that I was in the county for, they accredited me for a total of 53 months, which I came home like nine and a half years after that. Got you. So you in prison for those nine years, mm -hmm. you come out, and then this is when now you start, you change the record label name to your name. Yeah, yeah, that's that's when I decided to do that. Um, yeah, when I met Charlie Baltimore. Now, so tell me a little bit about Charlie Baltimore. How did y'all meet? Because at this time, what Charlie Baltimore was on Bad Boy at one point in time, right? Yeah, and um, a friend of mine was out of New York, Tino, was out of New York, ran into tour. I wasn't even doing music. He just used that as a cop game. My brother can help you with, with your music. I wasn't even, I hadn't started no label or nothing. I ain't had nothing going on. You know what I'm saying? So he was like, hey man, I told, you know, Charlie, she gonna, she gonna come here, man, you got with the music. So he really trying to knock her. You know what I mean? So yeah. when she came there and introduced me to her, I listened to her story. So from hearing her story, I empathize with the pain that she was, that she was living. You know what I'm saying? From all the shit she been through but I also empathize with her passion that she still had for music. So after talking to her that day, 
I had a house on um, Eight Mile and Mash, right, in Warren. I had a studio done in 40 days. Mm. I built that studio just for her, you know what I mean? But I wasn't doing music. By that time, you- Trick had already blew up on his own, you know what I mean? So it wasn't no sense for me. He already there. Now, the idea is people may seem like, so did you and Charlie Baltimore partner together and start the label? It was just simply yours. No, nah, it was just it was just really me. But what I did was from the trailblazing that I did with her, I was running across artists and I was bringing them on as a part of BMB. You know what I mean? Um, anybody that her or Trick said that they thought was tight is who I signed. Got you. So what's your relationship like with Charlie Baltimore now? And kind of explain to me, like, where y'all stand right now? Well, we really don't stand right now. Um, I had a situation where one of my artists um, <clears throat> cashed out, and she decided to jump on that bandwagon because she was mad because her and my second wife had got into it. And my second wife, had, you know, kind of like beat her up real bad. You know what I'm saying? And um, yeah. and uh, so she was mad at me. And they at that time, they both wanted me to go to, go to prison. So, you know, she had joined that. And they had uh, uh, affidavits. They said they had affidavits from her stating that I beat her and some old stuff. But it was really my wife. And they, but they was going to use that and say it was me. So it can kind of like revoke uh, my bond from the shit that happened between, you know, the cash. Oh shit. man. So did you ever go back because of that or no? No, man. Like, whew. this is, this is, this is, this is a touchy situation right here. Cause it's, it's, it's like crazy. Like why you have to be good no matter what, because when I was on a run fr- from 92 to 96, I was living out in California. I ended up getting a three picture movie deal were World, Worldwide Motion Pictures under my fake name. In the process of me doing that, um, I ran across a kid that was just cool. He was kind of like I, one of the guys here that's just doing extra, just making sure every shit, t- shit tight. You know what I mean? He was just working extremely hard. And so I just started talking to him a lot. You know what I mean? So, and I was asking why was he, you know, what made him want to, you know, work in music, you know what I mean, and film. So he was like, well, I'm really just trying to get some extra money to go to college. You know what I mean? So, um, and I'm telling you what he told me probably three years ago, four years ago. I don't remember none of this shit. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah. So he said that, um, he said that, he said he just wanted to go to college. I asked him how much his tuition was. So he told me what his tuition, he said, I to- I, he told me what his tuition was and I gave him the money for all four years of college. And the reason why I know, I, I'm just thinking why I probably gave him the money for four years of college because I knew I was in America's most one. I probably can die or go to prison for the rest of my life and I won't be able to help him no more. So I at least wanted yeah. to cover the college. You know what I'm saying? Now, fast forward, um, the shit happened to me. I ended up being on house arrest and teller for constructive felon possession of a felony firearm. You know what I'm saying? That's some shit that we had talk about too whenever you bring the cast out. If you bring that up, it don't matter. But I ended up, I ended up going to jail. They, they uh, raided all my houses at once. They found the gun over my second wife house. It got me in constructive possession of felony firearm. At this time, I only had John Royal. I didn't know, you know, um, Steve Fishman at the time, but one of my partners knew him. Now, Fishman is the lawyer to go to if you're trying to get somebody to leverage whatever the fuck they got going on because of his track record. You know what I'm saying? And who he know and how long he been in it. So he brought Fishman in and Fishman got me a bond, which they put a tether on me for the shit. My other lawyer, I still would have fought my, I would have beaten the case still, but I would end up fighting it from prison. Cause he wanted them like no nonsense. Like nigga, we ain't talking. No, he wanted them. You know what I mean? So, um, so, uh, so anyway, Fishman up getting me out, but, But oh, let me go back to the dude. So probably about probably about eight months after that, I ended up running into the dude in California. 
So when I run into him, he looking at me. And you can tell this dude is somebody serious because, you know, the people that's with him got the little shit in their ear, you know, the little walkie-talkie shit. So I'm looking at yeah. he looking at me like, what's your name? So I said, Peanut. So he's like, nah, what's your name name? So I said, Brian, Brian Maurice Brown. So I'm thinking he might be some kind of politician or police. So he looking like, nah. He like, you don't go by nothing else? I say, Mr. BMB. He like, nah. He like, Mike, you know. So when he said that, I knew that he had to know me from the time I was on the run because that was the name I was using. You know what I'm saying? Michael J. Watts. You know what I mean? So when he said that, uh, now I'm trying to, my recall is fucked up because when I was on a run, I was really going through a lot. So the only way to keep my sanity, I learned how to block out my recall. And I'm still yeah. fucked up to this day. I'm talking about I done ran into women that I didn't live with in some old shit and just can't remember nothing. You know, like nothing, like at all. You know what I mean? So, so, um, so, um, Damn, I lost my train. So you, you, you ran into him. And he oh yeah, to okay, out yeah, 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 yeah. So I ran into him. So, so, so he was telling me that I gave him the money for the four years of college. So when I ran into him again, he was saying, um, "Mike, Mike." So I'm like, "Oh." So he was like, "So I said, Kevin Lance. Those are the guys I was promoting at the time under my fake name." So he was like, "Yeah." So, so he was like, "Okay." So you don't remember me? I say, "No, I don't remember you though." But I do remember that time and who I was working with and who I was pushing at the time. He was like, I'm the kid that you gave the money to for the college. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, no. Nah. So, so, um, so, um, oh yeah, so he, so he said, I'm, I'm not, so I couldn't remember. He tried to make me remember he called his mama. Ma, you remember that guy I was telling you about? Ooh, ooh. You know what I'm saying? I gave me the money for school. I'm sitting here right one night. He don't even remember me. So she thanked me, you know what I'm saying, or whatnot, you know what I mean, or whatever. But so after that, he was asking me what's going on with me. I said, well, I'm really on bond for a case. I'm probably going to have to do like 51 months. You know what I'm saying? I said, for what? I said, constructive possession of felony firearm. I said, found the gun over my second wife's house. I wasn't there. The house not on my name. None of that shit. You know what I mean? So he's like, hmm, so what's your name again? So I told him my name. And he took my number down. You know what I'm saying? So he was like, all right, man, it's good to see you, man. Like, God ah, damn, I appreciate you so much. Right? So that was it. So the day of my sentencing, you know what I'm saying? Man, that shit crazy. I go to sentencing. This judge was saying all kind of great shit, but I'm certain it, has, it would already have something to do with fishermen because fishermen kept... Because they kept putting me in the newspaper. They kept putting me in the newspaper on, a, in a, you know, different Detroit Free Press, Detroit News. So we didn't want to go to court why they keep freshly putting me in the newspaper. So Fishman kept pushing it back, kept pushing it back, kept pushing it back until, like, it just died completely down. Now, in the process of it died down, I ran into dude. So now the day of my sentencing, mm, this lady, the, the judge says so much great shit about me, I'm thinking that she had the wrong docket. I ain't never been a favorite. You feel what I'm saying? So all the shit she was saying, I'm like, she can't be talking about me. You know what I mean? So long story short, um, long story short, uh, she was saying all this great shit, girl, all this great shit. So she was like, his sentence is anywhere from, uh, uh, what'd she say? It is anywhere from 31 to 51 months or something like that. You know what I'm saying? But I'm going to say that, uh, like, I didn't I research and, and check Mr. Brown's record. He have no history of violence. You know what I'm saying? Um, he's been an outstanding citizen. He's been paying his taxes. You know what I mean? Um, even in prison, he, you know what I'm saying? Like, he wasn't, you know what I'm saying, a problem. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that even if he possessed the gun, he would have done any harm with it. You know what I'm saying? Although, like, I don't even know how this case is even before me because he don't live at the house. The house not in his name. You know what I mean? Like, how, how we here, we here now, but I got to adjudicate the case. I got to judge the case. You know what I'm saying? And because uh, uh, it's up to me, if I want to go up with departure or down with departure, and because of what I feel and see in Mr. Brown, 
I'm going to go down with I'm going to go down with departure. You know what I'm saying? And I'm going to take his sentence from whatever it was to a year and a day. Okay. So that that's probably six, seven months. So when she said that, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, man, because my brother got the same fucking case. Like my brother, my little brother, we ended up getting the same cases, the indictments, and then the same gun cases, and he ended up getting 51 months. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, so, um, so after that, over with, boom, leave. I'm leaving. We're preparing to go to dinner. I couldn't believe it. You know what I'm saying? So on the way to dinner, my phone ring. Hello? Yeah, I heard you got favor. Real distinct, strong voice. I'm like, yeah, who is this? He like, I'm Senator such and such and such and such. He's like, man, I've been dying at the opportunity to repay you. You know what I'm saying? Then he, was, then he said that, then he was like, you ain't gonna have to do it. Just don't even trip. Just go through the motions and however they work it out, let them work it out. You know, just know that you ain't, you know what I mean? You ain't got to do nothing crazy. Just relax. You know what I'm saying? But he, he was like, I can't talk to you because you're a high boy. What I advise you to do is when you're done with your case is to leave because you got a couple of overzealous people there that don't want to see you free. You know what I mean? So um, that's how that whole situation ended up happening. Got you. Now, now give me, how did you end up, <clears throat> excuse me, how did you end up meeting Vezo? And, and, and signing him. Meeting who? I used to wear Vezo. Oh, um, shit from just rotating. I forgot who introduced me to him, though. I met him from just rotating, <clears throat> and, he was in a, and he was in a bad contract. Now, okay. he wasn't in a bad contract, but the, he, he was signed to some policemen or something. And they wasn't really pushing him like he felt like they can push him. So he wanted out of his contract. So when I get with him, you know, like um, he motivated me because he's a hard worker, man. He always just working, putting out records and doing stuff. So I paid for him to get out of his contract, but he was supposed to sign with me. So I paid for him, to get out of his contract, gave him some money. The money I gave him, he ended up signing an iced up record. He ended up starting that and just went his way and he never did what he was supposed to do. Got you. So you, you paid for him out of the contract. Mm-hmm. But he never signed with you. No. Did the money you advanced to him? Did you? Did he give that back to you? Is that how that worked? <laughs> hey man, listen. He ain't do nothing he was supposed to do. You hear me? You know, uh, if, if if I was adjudicating it on the streets, we probably wouldn't even have ice with Vezo. But because I really love him, you know what I'm saying, yeah. and I respected his craft and his workmanship. Like, and that's the problem with you know, it, it ain't a problem. But I really love the people I fuck with. When I start fucking with them, I, I fall in love with them and I get off into them because it motivates me to do more. So at, so when they do something wrong, it'd be hard for me to switch back to street shit because I didn't already acquire the love for them. Yeah. So I, for, I guess for artists who, who's learning the game and things of that nature, <clears throat> excuse me, what, what was it that he was supposed to have done well, well the first thing, the first thing, he been handled? yeah, the first thing he was supposed to do was sign. You know what I mean? Right. And even if the contract wasn't up to his liking, we could have got it to where he wanted it. You know what I mean? But that that was never their plan. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just felt like that was never their plan. So um, he didn't do that. Uh, once he got on, he still ain't gave me anything back, even though I'm certain it's a lot of interest by now. But he ain't did shit. So at the end of the day, if you was to sum it all up you think the ploy for for Vezo was pretty much to kind of use you as a bank. Mm-hmm. Kind of just pay that off. Probably because they didn't have the money to pay out of it. Use that with no intentions of ever signing. Exactly. And even like when we was rotating, you know what I'm saying? I noticed that his manager was trying to get every resource that I had. Like if we go to music choice, she's trying to get the numbers. If we go... Whoever radio I was using, she was trying to get the number. So I was just seeing it. But again, when I love my people, I love them. And I'm transparent. Like, what's mine is yours. And I don't care about, you know what I'm saying? If they want to fuck with you, they so be it. You know what I'm saying? But I never thought at that time what they were doing. Mm. 
You know what I mean? I just thought everything was, you know what I mean? Like she was just on her shit. Like, you know what I mean? Just making sure she checking behind and make sure her artist is straight. Now this is what year? Shit. About 15? Is this before you went to prison? No, this is definitely after. This, yeah, this it's, yeah, probably 16, 17. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So like since that time, because you know, like Vezo is a whole nother beast now, you know what I'm saying? Like career going crazy. I didn't see them pull up down here in Texas a few times. People show up, show love. Had you had a conversation with Vezo since the whole ordeal? Hey, y'all ran into each other. What's oh, yeah, that every like? time, you know, every time I see him, he keeps saying that, you know, he gonna do right. You know what I mean? I mean, he gonna get with me, but you know, it never happened. But again, I really be loving these cats. You know what I'm saying? That's really only for that. So, I, like, I'm at peace, honestly. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Now I am. But, you know, um, and I'll, it's, it really be my people that be making me mad. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, because I got a lot of powerful people all around the world. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I just, I've been a street nigga all around the world. You know what I mean? So, and in prison. You know what I mean? So I got a lot of powerful people. You know what I'm saying? That be trying to move. And I'd be like, no, man, please. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, he's doing good for the city. You know what I mean? Let's look at it for the bigger picture. You know what I mean? He's doing good for the city. You know, just let him rock. You know what I'm saying? If he do good by me, then he do good by me. If he don't, like, I done it for my heart. You know what I mean? I done it for my heart. I didn't have, I could have leveraged him with the contract. You know what I mean? Like, you really want, I could have had him sign, you know, sign my contract first and I'll pay this. You know, I didn't, I love the kid. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so I done it for my heart. You know what I mean? So, you know, um, I was at peace with it. Now, recently, um, Cash Doll sat down with Vlad TV mm -hmm. and, and did an interview. Did you Did you have a chance to check it out? No, everybody keeps sending it to me, but I really, I, I really didn't look at it, and I just hear the pieces that they talk about. You know what I'm saying? For okay. them telling me, but I didn't look at it. Because she didn't done so many interviews, it's probably going to be all the same shit. It was sent to me. Yeah. So one of the big, the, some of the big takes that came around from it was, a write up in the free press that says she signed to you for a fifteen thousand dollar boob job. <laughs> she denied that she didn't sign for plastic surgery. Can you elaborate what was her deal? Okay, let me let me have this disclaimer first because I want everybody to understand. Cash Doll was a young lady when I got with her. She's not. She was nowhere near street, even though she's from Dexter Linwood area. She's not. She's a young girl that was trying to make it on her own. You know what I'm saying? And she was misled or manipulated by the dude that she was with, which is how I met her. You know what I'm saying? The dude I did six years with in the prison. So a lot of the stuff, it was hard for me to really blame her because she was young and really didn't know and wasn't really conscious or illiterate like that. You know what I mean? But no, she didn't sign for a boo job. That shit came with just fucking with me. Anything she needed to, you know, help her brand, you know what I'm saying? Whether it's a boob job, whether it's, you know what I'm saying? Uh, having a, a, a Rolls Royce waiting for when she get off the plane, you know what I mean? Just everything I did to make people buy into the cash dial brand I did. Anything that girl gotcha. went to sleep and woke up and said she wanted, I put there, you know what I mean? So that's just what I do when I fuck with a motherfucker. You know what I mean? It wasn't about, you know what I'm saying? Her signing for that. I don't even remember what, how much cash it was, but it wasn't that. Everything that came after that is what she got from my heart. What drew you to Cash Doll? Huh? What 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 drew what about Cash Doll uh, drew you to her that made you want to even Man, go down that like, road? Like with really, it was my dude. I didn't know her at all. You know what I'm saying? But after fucking with her, I fell in love with her because she ended up being at that time one of the greatest entertainers I ever seen. She know how to captivate a motherfucking audience. So I fell in love with her character and her craft. You know what I'm saying? And I seen this girl work, man. Like when we traveling, this motherfucker will DM every motherfucking body. When she put something out, she would DM, take her time to DM every fucking body, post my stuff, post my stuff. I'm talking about she would DM 2,000 people a day. Mm. Post my stuff, post my stuff. So man, how can you not fall in love with somebody who making your investment easy? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and that's just what it was. Now, <clears throat> the rumor has it, or not necessarily rumor, but allegedly Cash Doll gave a statement. Mm -hmm. um, it was a 50 page, you know, federal court document. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Did she Again, make a statement? I want y'all to understand. Like, I want y'all to people to understand because I know a lot of y'all love me and a lot of y'all, you know, just like write shit and want to, you know what I'm saying, adjudicate shit. 
The girl was young. She was manipulated, you know what I'm saying, and all that. I'm not holding her accountable, and I want y'all to hold her accountable. But, yeah, the dude utilized her, and they made some statements, and they said I had guns, money, and drugs in all my cribs. They took almost $6 million from me. Damn. You know what I'm saying? The part that killed me, they took my wife's shit. You know what I mean? Like all her furs and jewelry and cars, you know what I mean? And all that old shit. You know what I mean? Like, I, you know, we, we, we hustlers. We get that shit right back. Our shit. But when they fuck with your wife and all that, you know, kids and all that type of shit, that shit, that's what hurt me. You know what I mean? So they took all my shit from that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and as you know, like, I never made a statement or did an interview about it. This is the first time I ever talked about this, bro. Mm. You're the first person that I ever talked about this to. My closest people know. The people that call me all the time, talking about she right here. Like, she got, I wrote Trick, Trick. I started with Trick Trick. Every fucking security, every fucking club worked for us at one point. We was really the goon squad. We had every big motherfucker that it was out there. You know what I'm saying? And they all work in the clubs now. You know what I mean? So, like, every time she moved, they would call me. What you want me to do? Make sure she get home, please. You know what I'm saying? And everybody felt like I was sick for not doing anything behind all of that. But like I said, like, she's not a street motherfucker. You know what I mean? And she was manipulated. You know what I'm saying? Like, come on, man. The, the niggas, as niggas, we know that how much control we can have over a broad mind. You know what I'm saying? So sure. I, I couldn't really hold her accountable. I still can't hold her accountable, and I love her to this day. That's why, you know what I'm saying? Like, again, like, everything is love. You know what I mean? Like, I have more calls all around the world you know what I'm saying? Diffusing the situation versus, you know what I mean? Me harnessing any resentment. No, for sure. That's love, no, man. That's real love absolutely. because I could easily been uh -huh. like, I'm going to hit you right back and call from a bat phone. You know what I mean? Gotcha. Yeah, but I never, you know, like I never wanted that or for her or Vezo. You know what I mean? Like I really love these, love them, bro. Like I really love them. You know what I mean? Like, and, and that's, that's where... What differs from me versus a lot of people because I, when I love somebody, it's unconditional. It's not conditional, predicated on you provide a certain service. Now, if you fuck up, that's when you fuck up and you realize that you're going to fuck up from losing a motherfucker like me. You know what I mean? Because, like, it's nothing I won't do. Yeah. It, it, even though you knew she, you know, like, especially knowing that she was kind of manipulated, well, manipulated and coerced, was there ever time, though, that you were like, man, like, I don't care? if she was manipulated or not? Like, was it a time where you felt like you wanted to crash out? Nah, because I'm a thinker, bro, and I've been a leader since 1819. And I've been yeah. a loner. So for me, I ain't never had the, 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 the part of me where I just got to be on rah-rah time because I'm by myself and my, fa my fucking family don't want to leave the goddamn neighborhood. So I can't yeah. hit and miss because then my whole family get wiped the fuck out. So I got to be methodical with mine. You know what I mean? Gotcha. So I can never, I just never consumed that anyway. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just like, she gonna like, cause honestly, I wanted to just let her go from the very beginning. It was this new president I had. You know what I'm saying? That was like, nah, we can't keep doing that, bro. Cause people will keep coming on and getting on. Cause he heard about the vessel. You know what I mean? Like people gonna keep coming on, using you and getting the fuck on. You know what I mean? So cash out was really the first contract I ever done. By that time I done took 12, 15 artists all around the world 10 times. With no contract. Yeah. You know what I mean? So she was actually literally damn near the first contract. Her then Lil George. Got you. Sp speaking of Lil George, because Lil George is your nephew. Mm-hmm. My sister's first and only son. Got you. And, and his song ended up hitting, like, what, number one on the on digital billboard sales? Yeah, number one on billboards. His record was getting, spay getting spent 1,800 times a week. I got the sauce. And this, at this time it happened, well, as you, huh? the time you were getting indicted on the gun charges, at, was, when did this song go off? Man, it went off, it, it was going on way before then, way before Cash Dial signed. You know what I'm saying? That was actually a big motivation, inspiration for her to want to sign because she seen what I was doing with him. Because yeah. she used to always say, I want what little George got. <laughs> I want you to do that to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, but he ended up leaving. Huh? But why did George, Lil George, end up leaving and departing away from you? And how did you because feel? Because at that time, him and Cash Dial was super motherfucking cool. You know what I'm saying? And they didn't know what my fate was going to be. Everybody thought I was going to prison. You know what mm. I'm saying? So he came. He came. I was living right down the street. 
at a bigger house. You know what I'm saying? And he came, him and my him and my sister, and said he wanted to be released. You know what I mean? So, you know, um, like I said, unconditionally loved. So I released him. You know, my sister and them thought it was gonna be a big old thing, but like if you think you're gonna get somebody better than me, I mean, so be it. You know what I mean? And only now that part hurt me because I chose him to get behind him to carry our family. You know what I mean? I didn't invest in none of my kids at the time. He was the one I chose and he wasn't my own. You know what I'm saying? To, to help yeah. solidify the legacy of our family. You know what I'm saying? So for him coming to actually be released during a time when I was going through something, you know, that's that hurt it. That hurt yeah, it. I can only imagine. Huh? I said, man, I can only imagine. Yeah. But it, it seemed like this is kind of like the story though. Like you, 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 you give from your heart. You you see the business, but like you say, you kind of love art. You love who you love. You fall in love with your artist, but it don't end up sticking because kind of the same thing with Ayo and Tao. Yeah. With the Rolex song went mm -hmm. crazy, but that went crazy right after they left your label. So what happened with that? And how did you take that? Um, I didn't really take it no kind of way because again, they were super now them really kids. You know what yeah. I'm saying? The person that he had managed, the person that they had managing them just wasn't right. You know what I'm saying? They lived with me for a little time. They just wasn't right. So by the time they got with Jazzy Faye and them down there, they didn't got rid of the dude. Got you. And they were kids. You're talking about 13, 14. You know what I mean? 15. You know what I mean? So like they really ain't had no control over the situation, but I'm the one who put in their head they need to make a song because they sitting there blowing everybody else up, dancing to everybody else's songs. You know what I'm saying? Also, Zay Hilfiger. You know, all them guys started off, they A on tail and Zay Hilfiger was dancing for Q9. Got you. Juju on the beat. So so when they leave you, how how long after they departing you, like in, like you said, going with Jazzy Faye, I guess, mm -hmm. when that record broke off, broke up, well, blew up, I guess I could say. How did you feel about once you saw that just explode like that? Do you like, damn, I wish I would have did more? Nah, cause this dude was this dude was different. Know what I'm saying? I utterly had to hurt this dude because, you know, to actually protect them. This dude was a little different. You know what gotcha. I'm saying? Like he like he he ain't really mean them no good for real. So and he really had them. I don't know how in the hell Jazzy Phantom figured it out, but you know, and then for me. I'm not the person that's going to, you know what I'm saying, create mutiny to, to you know, if it's not going to be easy, I ain't going to do it. You know what I'm saying? But at the yeah. same time, I'm going to give you everything you need while you're with me because I fuck with you. But, you know, if they're not going to make the business easy, I don't want it. Got you. Now, I, I kind of want to get ready to end with this. We'll get ready to wrap it up, man. But did, did you ever get paid your money from Ray J? What's your, what's your status with Ray J, man? Did he um, cut you your check? No, but... What Ray J will do, anything I ask him, bro. Got you. You know what I'm saying? I can call him right now and whatever Peanut won't, whatever he won't. You know what I'm saying? Like anything that I ask him, bro. So that's better than payment to me. When well, a person well, Ray J, give me himself. In, uh, but he would give me himself for it, however I need him. Got you. But because I had a bad president in the middle of my, my business between him and Ray J, the business never got done because I, I met Ray J through him. You know what I mean? Mm. So I entrusted him to do everything right. He didn't do it right, but I love Ray J too. So again, but he would give me himself however I need him, bro. Got you. So like, what was the dollar figure? Because the, the rumor out there, you invested something. Uh, like, I, you know, I, I, you like trying like to get me trying to, to get tax evasion now, bro. Something <laughs> crazy like that? <laughs> That's tax evasion case right there, bro. Um, <laughs> I don't really got like you. to talk I about it you. like that. No doubt, but so but but y'all relationship is good though. Yeah, it's like great, said, man. Like Ray J up. is a solid, you know, he's a good dude. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. He um he grew up in Hollywood, so you know he have his times where he's at. But for the most part, that person's a work. He's a workaholic, and he's a dude. Like I say, anytime I call him, it's whatever I want. So yeah. Now to kind of circle back, you said you 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 had spoke to Suge Knight earlier uh -huh. and he was giving over your life, his life rights to you to 
do a film. But the rumor out there, Suge Knight has sold his life rights to so many people. He did what now? That Suge Knight has, he's already known for selling his life rights to so many di- different people to do projects. Like, uh, I, you know, I really have no knowledge of that. We on some brotherhood shit. We not really yeah. on business. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, the brotherhood is spilling over into the business. You know what I'm saying? Um, and for me, I really don't got, I don't give a fuck about his life rights or none of that. I fucks with him. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I don't got to never do none of that, honestly. You know what I'm saying? And and actually just talking to him, man, is, is priceless because... It's, it's like I'm in history class every goddamn day. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, what I've learned, though, I got to be careful in what I tell him because he's starting to love me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I love and respect him. So I can't tell him, like, I can never tell him about what I talked about, about the art, the past artist. Yeah. Because he going <laughs> <he gonna move. laughs> to move. You know what I mean? So right now, uh, what's the um, what's the play for right right now? Like, where do BNB Records stand right now? What you working on right now? What you got your hands in as of right now? Well, what I'm working on the most is here. This is my flagship right here. Yeah, this Brooklyn Queen. This motherfucker here. This 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 motherfucker here is different. Yeah. When I tell you she different. She different. She gonna be the best thing out here on some Beyonce, Rihanna, Cardi B, all in one type shit. But um, but uh, I've been working on her, and I've been really concentrating on a movement for my producers. Uh, since 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 Cash Out, you know, I went through all that with all of the artists. I kind of like really got away from the grown motherfuckers, cause once you level them up, they got it all figured out. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I kind of like got away from them and I just been signing the younger younger people where I have to deal with their parents. You know what I'm saying? And who got still like a control over the kids' mind to where we can do good business. You know what I mean? Um, but again, like her, like she's the old, she's been here twice before. Like her loyalty, her work, her work ethic. You know what I'm saying? Like this is who the world should mimic behind being an artist. You know what I'm saying? Because this little motherfucker is different. You know what I mean? Um, so I've been concentrating on her. Um, she's doing great. She's just not crossing over into like, you know what I'm saying? Like like her adult her adult side. She's 17 going on 18. So now we're allowing her to cuss a little bit. So her records is crazy now. You know what <laughs> I mean? She's feeling herself. You know what I mean? She's engaging with, you know what I'm saying, guys. You know what I mean? Um, so it's just, and the killing part about it, the music that she's writing and doing is what she's been listening to since 12 and 13. All her friends, you know what I mean? So she finally in her bag where she can do the music that she can listen to herself versus just doing the music for the kids. But mainly her, Dre Butters, Jupiter. Then I got another artist that I'm, that I'm focusing on from Cincinnati. He's my nephew. His name is Dash Guapo. Different. Very, 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 very different. You know what I mean? Um, super, super, super talented, man. Boy got over 2,000 songs ready. You know what I mean? Um, and he, you can give him a, a topic and he's going to go in there and he's going to give you some quality music with metaphors and everything. You know what I mean? So um, Dash, Guapo, Butters, Jupiter, Kevo, Brooklyn. Um, now I got Yanni. Yanni just did a record with Brooklyn called Receipts from, you know what I'm saying, a little um, a little beef they got with a little guy. You know what I mean? Um, uh, then I got uh, I got another niece who's actually signed um, Ice, but she's, you know, she's kind of dealing with, her daughter just passed a few years back. She's kind of still going uh-huh. through that, so she's mourning. So whenever she's ready, I'm going to get on her. You know, and then I always got like, I, I, you know, like my niece, like she's my niece, but she's doing her own thing. And that's Carla Ray, the CEO. You know what I mean? But uh, whatever she needs from me, you know, I give her. But, you know, she's been an administrator for so long. She pretty much knows what to do. So she's just been moving, you know, moving on her own. But uh, for the most part, man, just my producers, Brooklyn Dash Guapo. And my producers, Dre Butters and Jupiter. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And then Kevo, you know what I'm saying? He, he's just not going to come on board as a writer or artist. 
you know, but. So heavy motion, man. I tell you what, man, I, I appreciate you sitting with me. Uh, you know, when the artists ready to do media runs and want to come sit down, man, they always got a, a place here at Mogul State of Mind, man. And uh, hopefully we can sit down again once, you know, they start rolling out. Okay, for sure. Appreciate hey, well, it. Mr. B&B, man, until we meet again. My man. Talk to you soon. All right, for sure.